Thank you, uh, Christoph. It's, it's very nice to be in Cambridge. I was speaking to the lady here that I, um, I think that uh, COVID does that. I um, um, wasn't actually quite sure when I had last been here. Um, I think it possibly was sometime before COVID. Um, and uh, I have many happy memories, including of Mangala. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I have some uh, interesting things. I spent part of my summer um, uh, editing um, a piece of hers uh, on, um, I think I'm to be mic. You are to be mic, yes. Uh, um, I had spent part of my summer editing a piece which is um, on yoga, which is a, a sort of academic extension of her well-known article on yoga, um, which uh, possibly, because uh, it may be one of her last uh, pieces of writing, and um, a sort of um, quite, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, correct response to uh, some people who would get enthusiastic about it, but also an appreciation. So um, that will be coming out in uh, a volume, uh, which I'm editing with uh, two of my friends, Thomas Katoy and Paula Dusser, from On Orthodoxy and World Religions, um, which has a, a preface from Archbishop Anastasius and a... Uh, a, a sort of final response from Frank Clooney. Um, and that comes out from Brill in the next uh, year. It'll be the first um, piece in English, which will look at orthodoxy and world religions in a comparative way and theology of religions. And um, uh, I just thought how appropriate it was uh, that she is to be a part of that. Now, but to turn to now for something completely different, um, uh, I wanted to, when I was asked to do this, um, I realized that the, there were a variety of different speakers uh, you know, um, uh, on many, many different topics. And I realized that I'd been put as the first to sort of give a general overview to set things out. And so um, uh, uh, that will be what I'm doing. I'm setting out a, a sort of broad vision, which I hope that everything can kind of slot in to. So, um, I want to say that God is only present in the everyday, in all our work and life, as the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which is to come. And the human being who wishes to find him in the everyday, in the minutiae of our lives, and above all, our working lives, must therefore live as if the present world, and with it this very moment, was a window into that age to come. But how might we do this? In my presentation, I want to set out a general vision of how the Christian path is to live in and through the world, producing, distributing, and consuming that world, in short, living and working as both a natural and supernatural act of communion. But this, as we shall argue, presupposes an alternative vision of the human being as not merely one who uses the world for its own benefit, but who cares for it, pastors it, completes it as a so-called priest of creation. Or let us suggest a new term, priest of the everyday. As priests of the everyday, our life and work is a Eucharistic act involving the sanctification and resurrection of the world in all its forms. Now, the concept of the world in the New Testament has a double, even a contradictory sense. And these two senses have to be held together through a sort of spiritual act of faith as intimates. On the one hand, um, we must say a decisive yes of God and with God to the world, an affirmation of the world. Uh, God takes joy in and loves the world. He loves the world. Uh, and St. John tells us he joined with it for its salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Yet, also in contrast to this affirmation, we have a decisive no to the world, a negation to everything in creation, uh, seeing it is luring men to their damnation, vanity of vanities. Anthony the Great tells us, hate the world and all that is in it. And uh, one is reminded here of um, a popular zine or magazine uh, from out of um, uh, the monastery in Palatina, California, called Death to the World, The Last True Rebellion. 
So this is orthodox as well. And we see this in the same beloved apostle who uh, says, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the father is not in him. Now this duality of how we view the world is intrinsic to the Christian path. The meaning of the world, it's fundamental telos and vocation only comes through our constantly referring it and by referring it, offering it back to God so that it may once more be revealed under its fundamental divine intention, its logos, as the manifestation of God's kingdom, which is to come. Now, if we cultivate exchange and consume the world without the very contemplation and asceticism, which tells us to also flee that world, without the liturgical action of lifting that world back up to God, who is the coming one, thine own of thine own, without, in short, prayer, then the world will become ashes in our mouth, death to the touch, dead weight. But when the world is seen through the eyes of prayer, when we put aside our use of it for the end of our desires, when we give thanks to God, lifting up our hearts on high in each moment of the day, and by cultivating the world with loving care in every action, living and breathing, we might say anaphorally, then that world is received back in resurrected and transfigured form as Christ with us. Christ himself stares out at us in this new shimmering creation, which finds its origins in the kingdom which is to come. So the world to have value, its true value, must constantly be renewed resurrected, completed by our activity, worked, transfigured, sophianized. To put this in more explicitly theological terms, the revelation of the sacramentality of the world is dependent on human beings' orientation to God in their action, their work in and through the world. But for this sacramental vision to be the case, we need to put aside the lie so many Orthodox and non-Orthodox believers have, especially clerics like myself, that the church is alien from the world. Orthodoxy in this form is a sort of incense-drenched, iconodule, natural religion with church collapsed into clergy. Yeats, the poet, was much closer to the basic sacramental intuition of orthodoxy, of the holiness of the world, seen in the light of the kingdom, when he wrote that all things remain in God. And in another poem, we are blessed by everything. Everything we look upon is blessed. So I want to argue that our living in the world, our activity, is our natural communion with the world and forms the basis of our union with that world life, which is the true meaning of the world. Natural communion then is potentially supernatural communion. This is Schmemann 101. I'm not giving my footnotes, but it's here. Sacramentality or communion with the divine is rooted in the world, in our embodied life. So when we eat a meal, we are consuming and partaking of the dead flesh of the world, from meat that used to be animals or fish to vegetables that used to be growing in the ground. The world in this eating is in us and us in the world. Here we have a cosmic communion and we live through the world by our transforming it into something new, resurrecting it. But this communion with the flesh of the world is potentially communion with God, as the human being, unlike other animals, can in production, distribution, and consumption can, in the whole panoply of living and working in the world, refer it back to its creator and his kingdom, which is to come, to bless God for the feud, the life, the persons, and the work he receives from them, or he or she. In a way, what we do in the everyday activity is to bring the world that surrounds us to meet the world which is to come, allow them, as it were, to meet and kiss. We allow our world's life to participate in the life of the kingdom. In Schmemann's words, 
the natural dependence of man upon the world was intended to be transformed constantly into communion with God in whom is all life. Now, here I've been here. taking my sweet time to come to the well-known idea in modern Orthodox theology, which is the notion of the human being, man, as priest of creation. And this is a notion often used in eco-theology ever since Zulus's 1989 lectures, Preserving God's Creation. But the human being, or man, male and female, then is called to live liturgically as priest of creation. And as I said, I want to reconceive this notion for today as priest of the everyday. God wishes us then to sanctify all the moments and places of this world. And this, I believe, is the basic trajectory of the idea. It is above all to live a life of gratitude, referring all things of the world back to God, to eat, to breathe, to sleep, to make love, to raise kids, to even excrete, can be communion with God. For in each of these acts, in different ways of natural communion with the world, we can receive not only physical life, but life abundantly, as St. John says, eternal life from God, if and only if we understand that these acts, each and every thing of the everyday, are not ends in themselves. I know that for some of you, it might scandalize that your bodily function could be media of grace. But I remember from my time at St. Vladimir's, uh, Dr. L. Rossi used to talk about sacred moments or memories you may have had from riding a bike in the countryside, an inspiration you had in a classroom, a word from a friend or even an enemy, reading a poem, falling in love, I can say myself that one of the most important sacred moments of my life happened suddenly and without warning through simply looking through a window at age 14. Another and very different sacred moment, which says a lot about me, happened when listening to a lecture on Aristotle. Some moments we cannot share as they are too private but most won't be in church or even uh, associated remotely with religion. In particular, God encounters us and reveals himself through certain memories that in retrospect are like epiphanies or theophanies of God. Here one thinks of Joyce and his Dubliners. These moments are incarnational insofar as God reveals his beauty to us in them in that they body forth grace like the mother of God whose feast we celebrated recently, or Moses being encountered by God at the burning bush, often these memories will have a changed retrospective significance, a transcendence quite apart from the actual event's factual description. I would say this charged significance of certain memories is witness to the power of faith in our lives, a belief that in the past God has revealed himself to us in the minutiae of our lives. So Wordsworth certainly was getting at this truth of the sacramentality of the everyday when he remembered on his couch in a flash upon his inward eye, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, you know the poem, beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Now here I would remind listeners that the fathers argued that God acts as a holy leaven in every aspect of our lives elevating, transfiguring everything for the kingdom and making it thereby, I would add, a means to our sacramental union with God in Christ. Becoming, as St. Maximus put it, a human being for the sake of human beings. He is in this moment. And so uh, by exchanging our place for his place, by this blessed exchange, Maximus says, it renders God man by reason of the divinization of man and man by uh, uh, God by man, God, man by reason of the divin divinization of man and man by reason of the incarnation of God. For the logos of God, who is God, wills always, he tells us, and in all things to accomplish the mystery of his embodiment. This mystery of embodiment happens everywhere, not just in the churchy things in life. It ha can happen now. God can seize it at this very moment. 
St. Simeon, the new theologian, puts it, we are made members of Christ, and Christ becomes our members, and Christ becomes my hand and the foot of all wretched me, and wretched I become the hand of Christ and the foot of Christ. I move my hand, and my hand is Christ entire. For understand me, the divine mystery is indivisible. But he then comes to an even more scandalous conclusion. For while we became many members, the saint tells us, he remains one and indivisible, and in each part is the whole Christ himself. And so thus you will know that both my finger and my penis are Christ. Uh, how more of a theology of the everyday than can you have than this? Yet there also exists a more down-to-earth and pastoral way of expressing these same truths. Recently, I was corresponding with a monastic friend of mine, and he wrote me, whatever the difficulties, he said, we encounter in the life of the church and the weaknesses of some of our representatives, we must believe that she remains, she, the church, remains the body of Christ and the kingdom we await and that she manifests herself in history through tipoi, signs that are not only the icons and the divine liturgy, but also, according to Father Emilianos, all the failures the aborted plans for pastoral action, the dreams and quarrels of individuals. God can manifest himself through these. The church is all this mixture of all two human realities and divine grace, which never ceases to act in the midst of these weaknesses, like the leaven that makes the dough rise. But let's dive just a little bit more deeply into these ideas by turning to the anthropology behind them. So, I want to argue, Adam was called to cultivate the garden in Eden that God planted for him. And here I believe Adam is inclusive of men and women. This consisted both of unifying creation in himself, which we can see in the naming of the animals, but he did this precisely through referring everything back of that creation back to God. God gives man the garden as a gift to till and keep if and only if he keeps his commandment to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil indeed the hebrew term used for tilling avad and keeping shamar the garden in genesis 2:15 corresponds to the terms often used for explaining the levites duty to oversee proper worship at the temple the simultaneous elevation and tilling of creation required for Adam both gratitude for the gift of life given to man seen in the tree of life upon which he fed and which gave him immortality and above all a rich receptiveness and trust in all of God's commands. That is humility or groundedness. Creation and humanity in itself were mortal and both only could live through man's constant referral of the gifts of the world and himself back to God by his offering it as a priest of the everyday. Humanity is, as priest of the everyday, above all a mediator, insofar as it stands between heaven and earth in the midst of the cosmos. The world, the entire universe, was created by God as a living body with many members, with the human being understood to be its pinnacle and summation. Maximus, the confessor, articulated this famously as a cosmic liturgy. The body of the cosmos taken as a whole, implanted with the divine logi, which are the principles and wills of God by which he providentially guides and cares for the creation, with the human being leading the world in a song of praise. But another way of articulating this same vision is to talk about creation as the creaturely Sophia. This is Bogakov, Sergei Bogakov, which is the gift of the world as an expression of the ideal divine organism of God's life, the divine Sophia, the perpetual movement of love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which God loved, was possessed by God from the beginning of his way and which played eternally before him in joy. This is wisdom. 
the human being cultivates in this vision that creaturely Sophia, turning it ever back to its divine prototype through his creative activity in the world, recreating what exists above, so below. These are simply different theological ways of articulating the same mystery which Genesis tells us about. And again, it's a mystery. So it shouldn't be taken literally. Maximus sees the human being as a sort of natural bond, mediating the divided extremes and drawing them into unity through his parts and gathering them up to God as their author, completing thereby the work of creation. He says, man was called to achieve within himself the mode of creation's completion and so bring to light the great mystery of the divine plan, realizing in God the union of the extremes which exists among beings. In short, the human being sums up all things to and for God in a sacrifice of praise. Now, when humanity offers up itself and creation to God in a priestly elevation, it then receives it back transformed into a new humanity, partaking of the divine life, graciously synthesizing in itself the uncreated with the created. In other words, by freely making his own what is gifted to him by God, the human being starts the process of transforming the divine imprint more and more into the likeness of the Trinity, so that he might have a share of that very same being, which is the substance of the divine persons, becoming a partaker of the divine essence, leading one ancient writer, writer, Christian writer, to call humanity a portion of God. Now, when the human being disobeyed God, he condemned the world in himself to death took it from the calling to be united with God. And in dying, humanity and the world were tipped back into the ground from which they came to an existence outside the presence of God and his holy word, which brings life eternal. Humanity turned from the divinizing priestly work and, as it were, gave into the temptation of Satan. Instead of consciously accepting nature as a good and divinizing gift from the hands of God, humanity fed on it, turned to it, utilized it, used it, plundered it. The things of the world, as Schmemann observed, cannot by themselves bring life, but only as they are received and accepted for God's sake as being the bearers of the divine gift of life the, for the world, he says, is meaningful only when it is the sacrament of God's life. In Christ, the path of our priestly vocation is once more opened up again through, because he is the second Adam. Having lost in the fall our priestly garment, as it were, we gain it back in Jesus Christ as the eternal high priest of our salvation. Now, reflecting on our post-Lapsarian context, we can see that just as the world exists in two senses, as I mentioned at the beginning, for Christians, so too work exists in two senses. Originally, work was in the Edenic economy, free, selfless, and loving, a harmonious interaction of the human being with the world entrusted to him. The human being was to transform and complete nature by spreading life in new and diverse forms, and in this way to perfect and fully understand and know nature, humanizing it and bringing it as mediator the, uh, to the forces of creation into unity. In Bulgogovian, Bulgogovian terms, Bogakov, we can say that Adam was called to reveal the Sophianic character of nature by ever referring it back to the ultimate goal in God as the divine Sophia. With the fall, we have a cosmic catastrophe, a rupture between God and humanity, and with it, all of creation that humanity heads. Economic activity, our work in the world, becomes darkened and motivated by our need to survive 
Cursed is the ground because of you. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Scripture tells us after Jesus Christ and in his church as the new Eden and extended incarnation, work can once more return to the status it had in God's original intention. For we are called to resurrect or recreate the world of dead opaque matter into our own body and thereby allow it to become once again something strange and new, a gift. We are to return the world to its original Sophianic glory in each of our areas, in all of our lives. Here, homo orants, humanity as the priest of the everyday, becomes homo faber, man the maker. Now, we are called to exchange and distribute the world, consume it and participate it in its production as a process of sanctification. I've said that, but let me in my last bit lay a few of these things out to set them out for the conference. We'll see later during the conference examples of each of the forms of sanctification. And here I want to identify first the sanctification of time, just as a sketch, because we will have that in detail, and then the sanctification of place. Firstly, we have the sanctification of time. Time is so often experienced as an agony of moments, a cycle of death, like a snake swallowing its tail, with death and old age following quickly from youth, and then back again, again and again. But time as a fallen reality can be redeemed and saved and liberated in Jesus Christ. It can be baptized. Now, Sister Vasa will be describing one way of redeeming or buying back time and thereby fostering unity and belonging in time through praying the Liturgy of the Hours, as some of us did this morning in the chapel. But one can sanctify time, thereby completing creation, by simply setting aside a small window of our day for prayer. Or one can use the time of travel, for example, to say the Jesus prayer or intercessions. The church gives us various gifts to sanctify time. One thinks here of the prayer, often attributed to John Chrysostom, beginning, O Lord, deprive me not of your heavenly blessings, where there are individual intercessions for each of the hours of the day and night. My wife, years ago, wrote these prayers out and framed them next to the kitchen sink so that throughout the day she could seize on them as little arrow pairs to shoot up, as it were, to the creator. Next, we have the sanctification of space. By this, I mean that we lift up all our individual spaces as holy things, beautifying them and welcoming God into them through creating a sort of domestic temenos, an enclosure sacred to our God, Jesus Christ. And Aidan Hart will talk later about how this is done with icons. I saw this sanctification of place in Metropolitan Callistos. Um, who would often use the prayer of the heart um, to, as it were, sanctify his place and through his intercessions, which he would do using his prayer rope. Nadezhda Gorodetsky um, has a wonderful passage, which I'll quote to you, which talks about this sanctification of place using uh, the holy name, the, the prayer of the heart, the Jesus prayer. She says, we can apply this name to people books, flowers, to all things we meet, see, or think. The name of Jesus may become a mystical key to the world, an instrument of the hidden offering of everything and everyone, setting the divine seal on the world. That was one of Metropolitan Callistus's favorite uh, phrases. One might perhaps, she says, speak here of the priesthood of all believers something we Orthodox need to remember. In union with our high priest, we implore the spirit, make my prayer into a sacrament. Together, we have the uplifting to God of our time and the referral back to the creator of our space. And so we have the beginning of the process of the sanctification of our work by making a foretaste of the age to come, 
the completing and resurrecting of creation. I remember here as models of how work and life in the world can be sanctified, my own mentors in the Christian path. Metropolitan Callistos, who is often in my memory, was someone who embodied the priesthood of the everyday. His desk was his kitchen table. After breakfast, he would have a time of prayer, which in a period when I was caring for him, would be done propped up in his bed with a prayer rope, though I saw him do it as well in his study chair, surrounded by books and icons, which in some cases occupied their own separate chairs. He would then return to the kitchen to work on composing and revising essays or finishing the last volume of the Philokalia, surrounded at his kitchen table by icons of his favorite saints, especially Saint Seraphim. The everyday quite literally became sanctified by prayer with icons sitting next to cereal bowls. Lastly, I remember speaking to a monk from Newskeet Monastery in upstate New York, where one of my students is about to go um, to test his vocation. I was delighted to hear that this week. And this uh, monastery is known um, where the monks and the nuns breed and train German shepherds, as well as make uh, fabulous cheesecakes. The monk in question said that when he first joined the monastery, he was given the obedience of training dogs. He knew nothing about how to train animals and spent many frustrating hours trying to get the dogs to do the most basic things. He wondered, what on earth does training these animals have to do with being a monk, the spiritual life? But gradually, as the years proceeded, he came to see that any type of work could be made into a prayer, into an offering up to God, and a communion with him in love. He then saw that he was bonded to the animals organically. Here you are, remember, the natural communion, which can become supernatural communion. He was bonded to these animals organically. And the daily tasks of training, say to teach an animal to sit or fetch or obey commands, had a holiness to them when offered up to God. And this daily activity of prayerful work or a elabora was an echo of the liturgy celebrated in the community church and the prayers in his cell. So in conclusion, the priesthood of the everyday is open to all believers in Jesus Christ. We're called in our baptism to sanctify each moment, each place, and all aspects of our working lives, not to mention our leisure, so that they become windows into eternity, allowing the winds of the Spirit to blow through creation and renew and complete this world through the age to come. Let us, then, pray that this Spirit, the Comforter, who is everywhere present and ever filling and resurrecting all things, even in this moment, let us pray that he may enter our lives so that we may be living sacraments of the life of God, thereby becoming in our lives and times the beginning of the completion of creation in Christ's kingdom. Thank you. There's no time for uh, questions. Okay. Um, shoot. Mm -hmm. sure. ah. Please also, the online community is invited to ask questions. Um, please raise your hand so we can um, take your question. And of course, we are in the uh, home. Oh, I should, should, should say that. Um, as this is a sort of general thing, I mean, um, in order to prepare this talk, I simply went back and I reread some of my favorite writers. But I mean, everything that I'm saying here, nothing is original. It's um, you'll find all of what is in here, especially in Schmemann, but also in Stanaloi, 
in uh, Bogakov, in Metropolitan Kalosos, in Zazulis, um, uh, in um, all of these different writers. Uh, this is in in way one way uh, what modern Orthodox theology has contributed. It's just to bring Orthodoxy back to its liturgy and its liturgical vision of the world. Um, and uh, and in fact, in all monastic literature, you find this. So um, hopefully, uh, I've thrown in a little bit of Bogakov to be provocative, um, but uh, he was saying the same thing. Um, anyway, sorry. I speak into this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your lovely talk. Thank you. You mentioned um, Father Callistos, Metropolitan Callistos, mm. and I'm reminded about a talk that he gave here at the IOCS, and he said that um, uh, Gregory of Nazianzen, Gregory the Theologian, uh, in one of his uh, pieces, wrote that when God lived alone in the uncreated space. He called that, Gregory called that, the macrocosmos, the mm. large world. And then when God decided through his own will and love to create everything else, to create creation, he did so. And he called, Gregory called that the microcosmos, the little world. Mm. And then as the last act of creation, um, Gregory Nazianzen says, God places the macrocosmos, the big one, inside the micro, the little one. And Father Callistos, he was quite funny about this because he used to say um, translators translated it wrong and they put the little one inside the big one, but that wasn't the case. It was the big one inside the little. But if that's true, then we are already infused. Everything in creation is infused with God and his love and his will and all the rest of it. But the problem is we've forgotten it. So, um, and particularly in the Latin West, because we've got the so-called enlightenment mm. and we think the world was made from a big bang and quarks and things. And, um, and so he, uh, uh, I was talking with somebody this weekend and they were saying pretty very similar along the lines that you've been talking, but saying that the thing to do, therefore, is not to give up the world, to retreat from the world, to think the world is bad, but to think the world is good, but scrape away at all the bad bits that encrust it, scrape away all the micro bits which have covered up the macro underneath, as it were. And so by dedicating each day to saying, let's think about this work, not as the work of my hands, the micro, but as the work of God's hands, we can recover it inside. And that's what was suggested. So that's what the giving up bit was. It wasn't giving up on the world. It was giving up on the forgotten world, the fallen world. Well, it's very beautifully expressed. I mean, I... Uh... Yes, I mean, uh, um, Maximus in his Mystagogia, as well as in various other things, talks about the human being as a microcosm, and, and that is what... And, and I think that, uh, um, in a way, we need our hearts to be circumcised. We need, um, as it were, this is maybe, I suppose, the, the process of repentance, uh, to pray that God allow as it were, the veil which shades us from seeing that everything is shining, all things shining, which is, I think, in uh, the thin red line, uh, and see everything shimmering with the glory of God, with the Shekinah, um, uh, with the, with the, well, Bogakov talked about the, div uh, the divine Sophia in the creaturely Sophia. But this is obviously um, maybe a life's work. Um, I think here of my, um, something which many of the you will know of the conversation with Moravilov uh, um, of Saint Seraphim of the acquisition of the Holy Spirit, where he uh, he says, you know, you too are filled with the Spirit now, and he says, you know, I can't see this, and he grabs him by the shoulders, and he sees uh, that uh, the the the. the his face, the face of St. Seraphim is shining, like staring into the sun. He says, you know, I can't see you. I can see your lips moving. But he says, you are shining like that. 
you too are shining. Everything we look upon is blessed, as Yates says. And I, I wonder whether part of the difficulty for, especially for us, uh, uh, but for Western Christians as well, is that uh, we turn Christianity into a religion. I was reading this uh, in Schmemann, but you, you also find the, the critique in uh, Bogakov and in Bart. And we, we have all these elaborate rules that we do to, as it were, domesticate and uh, um, control the divine shining. So, you know, uh, in my parishes, and I do this because my, I think I would scandalize and be a stumbling block. You know, women are not allowed into uh, there. Now, I, the reasons for this are, are, we won't get into that, but, uh, and various things you aren't to touch. I remember years ago when I was a subdeacon and we're doing some sort of, uh, in Oxford, we're having a procession and um, the air fell on the ground and the, the priest gave me a deathly look when I picked it up, you know, because uh, I wasn't ordained to the right order to touch this. But this, I think, prevents us from seeing the truth, which is that God is here. So, yes, so beautifully expressed. We all need to read Eckhart. It's in Eckhart as well. Jeremy? Thank you. Um, you said that Homo orans has to become Homo faber, which is an interesting shift because normally um, I think of the world as having ended with we've become Homo faber, but you're saying no, we've become Homo orans, praising God, and then bring that praise back into the person who makes. Um, just to be really obscure, I have a dictionary of the Indo-European roots of the Indo-European language, and a lot of these roots are hypothetical, but it gives the hypothetical root of Faber, the maker, as Dhabr or Dobri, D-H-A-B-R-E, Dobri being good. And so God creates everything and declare that it is good. Mm. So the good, is the Dobri, is the Faba, is the maker. It's mm. a wonderful, almost hypothetical, but magical connection in the in the deep, deep, deep ancient roots of the Indo-European language. That's very nice, yes. Well, I, I stole that partially from Chenu, Maria Dominique Chenu, uh, who was a great uh, Dominican scholar, and he has a, a work on the theology of, of uh, work. And curiously enough, when I looked at, uh, this is a work, I had knew Chenu's work from uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who I've worked on a lot. But when I looked at the appendix, there was a, a commentary on Maximus. Um, so I think Maximus uh, is, is bringing across the very same things that you're telling us that exist, as it were, in the deep fabric of our language. Uh, he remains one of my uh, big inspirations. I, one of the things I find odd, just as a, as a commentary, is, is that um, the Orthodox have been going on about Maximus forever. But um, when I tried to put together a panel uh, of, at the American Academy of Religion, on Maximus scholars, there were, you know, some quite eminent uh, Western uh, Maximus scholars, but, you know, sort of, you know, patristic scholars. But when I went to the theologians, uh, the systematic theologians, they had absolutely not, no idea who Mas Maximus was. These are Western systematic theologians. So um, some of these truths that you're talking about need to be known more widely in the West. And it, I guess it's up to the Orthodox to, um, Tell people about them. Is there anybody um, online? No, I see all looking zomnabulant. <laughs> I'm not oh. looking zomnabulant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I may be looking zomnabulant, but I'm not zomnabulant. Um, the um the comment I would make from the point of view of the um Western Church as I know it, which is is the Anglicans, um, to some extent the Roman Catholics, um is that we have the problem of trying to push the God in the everyday too far in two ways. One of them is 
pushing worship out entirely. We don't try to sanctify life, we try to downgrade worship. Um, and the other one is um, in um, neglecting the reality of the fall. Um, and therefore, um, it's sort of you have an everything goes culture. Um, and I think that it's quite interesting sort of what what someone from the Orthodox tradition might say about coming from your direction and yet not avoiding those two things, as I imagine that you would consider both of them incorrect from what you're saying. Um, well, you can't avoid the fall in the Orthodox services, um, particularly during Lent. Um, and I suppose one of the reasons you can't avoid the fall in our services is our services are largely composed of either commentaries, liturgical commentaries on scripture or our readings of scripture. Um, and so uh, in that sense, we don't have to avoid that. Uh, if anything, we just need to be able to see it in light of this antinomy that I mentioned that you uh, have to be, as, a, as it were, hold together the reality of the brokenness of the world with its redemption in Jesus Christ. And then the other thing that you were mentioning, the other difficulty with, with the Western or Anglican tradition was that, uh, you remind me again, there was another one. We've, we've, thrown, we've thrown out worship entirely in, in the oh, sense yes. that worship has been massively downgraded. Um, yes. Well, I mean, I... I I, I have a lot, my daughter is a chorister at Exeter Cathedral. And um, so I see that, you know, worship still exists in a vibrant form in uh, the Anglican tradition. I, um, I myself am a cradle Anglican, uh, although I've now spent more of my life in the Orthodox Church than whatever I was before. Um, I suppose uh, one thing that, uh, you know, Anglicans can do is simply just go back to their own roots, uh, which uh, very much were a tradition of worship um, at its best, you know, even song, the various other uh, traditions. These are things, I mean, um, back when the liturgical movement was in its, uh, as it were, full steam um, and, you know, scholarship of liturgy was not for the very few. I look at friends, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of these people, um, Anglicans and uh, Catholics and Orthodox, they would meet regularly and, uh, and talk about, you know, the points of contact. So that maybe that's something we can do as well, is have a renewed type of um, uh, ecumenism of exchange. Um, Sadly, um, I mean, some of this exists on uh, the ground level, but in my experience, a lot of ecumenical dialogue tends to be dominated by um, sort of, at least in the Orthodox space, people from the top uh, uh, by uh, sort of, um, how shall we say, uh, official, um, usually our commandrites, official uh, type of theologians and bishops who are sort of assigned to this. And so um, it doesn't happen in the way that it did in the 1960s and 70s um, when they were tr drawing from a broader kind of perspective. But I, yes, I, um, that would be my response to that. Um, I go when I, I go to see my father and sister, I go and I worship with them in their Anglican church. And um, it's, it's, theirs is a sort of more low church tradition, but they have those things. They, they certainly don't get around worship, but I thank you for um, uh, sort of reminding of us of that. I, I didn't mean to say that we didn't have a tradition or that it isn't in some ways still a living tradition, but you will find in a lot of Anglican churches that if you suggest that in any sense it's a space for prayer or a space in which prayer should be protected, um, people will look at you as if you're crazy. Um, in in the sense that, that, that you sort of um, um, you sort of sit in a Good Friday in, in the church on Good Friday, and there are people picnicking outside the open door and making a massive racket, despite the fact that there are notices up asking people not to make a massive noise outside the door of the church. Um, but anyone would think you were totally insane if you suggested that perhaps something should be done about this. Yeah. Um, that, that's the sort of thing I'm thinking of. But I mean, the, the Anglican Church is very wide and very varied. So one can encounter a lot of different aspects of it, depending on where you go. I mean, I have no idea about Exeter, for example. 
Yes. Well, I mean, um, again, speaking from the Orthodox tradition, um, we do have a very much, I would say, and I, I, you know, work in multiple churches in Devon. We we have a strong sense in the Orthodox tradition of the holiness of, of space um, uh, and of um, various temenoi, I guess, um, uh, you know, kind of places that are set aside. Um, if anything, I think that sometimes it gets clouded by religion and and uh, and people are kept out of fully participating in those spaces. Um, here I'm thinking of the difficulties of inclusion of, of women in particular. Um, I was having an interesting conversation with uh, one of our, our speakers about um, somebody that she knows who has been or ordained to the order of deaconess um, uh, in my church in the ecumenical patriarchate, which was news to me. Um, and uh, what was interesting is I was um, thinking about how we can keep a holiness of space, but be more inclusive. Uh, I was in um, the island of Kufnisi in the Cyclades um, this summer before I went off to talk to Ukrainians and Volos. And I was in this tiny little church and um, I saw somebody going in and out of uh, the altar. And, and I thought, well, who's that? And then I realized that it was the Presbytera who was acting as the altar server, which was entirely appropriate. Um, and uh, so she did everything and entered into that space with great reverence and uh, acted as an altar server. So um, one can have a sense of the holiness of space, but not at the same time go to the, I think, the danger, which is is to make it rigid and, uh, uh, as it were, to, uh, you know, to, to lock people out, you know, to, to keep, as it were, the sacredness, almost like a kind of hermetically sealed box uh, and, and uh, make sure that grace doesn't get out of the deacon stores. So... That's sometimes my worry with my own church. Yes. We do it in a different well. way, but yeah. Um, I've got a question as well. Thank you. Um, yes. um, just just um, going back to the title of your talk. Yes. Um, and a sense of completing the world to come and the resurrection of creation and the, the role of work in it. Um, I'm just thinking of this verse that we say at the beginning of the liturgy, sometimes it's, it's silently in the altar between the priest and the deacon or by the mm -hmm. priest and, uh, alone with, it is time for the Lord to it's act. It's time for the Lord to act. It, and it's part of the, the psalm. Um, I, I miss that because yeah. uh, I'm now a priest. I yeah. don't get all the cool words. Exactly, yeah. But but um, but uh, I'm just, I'm, I wanted to ask something, maybe you can reflect on this verse and this idea of how do we have the liturgy after the liturgy because the Lord acts in the liturgy and we enter into that work, but it doesn't stop when the, when the liturgy stops. So um, if you could say something about that, both as a sort of a, a, yeah. a deacon, as you say, and, and as a priest now, and, and as a, just a Christian, how do we continue the liturgy after the liturgy in that spirit of entering into God's work, which never stops in a sense? Yeah. So, I mean, the liturgy after the liturgy, the expression comes from Ion Bria, mm -hmm. um, a Romanian theologian. And I would say that uh, it is precisely what this lady was, was mentioning here. It's this sense of being able to see the holiness which is us just in the everyday life. And this comes through ascetical, uh, the ascetical tradition, through being as it, as it were, be able to hold the world, which is the world which God intended to do with the, the broken world, because there is a broken world, and allow these tools that are given to us, whether that be praying the hours, whether it be the Jesus prayer, to allow these things to, as it were, um, be like kind of almost if our heart was surrounded by ice, you know, kind of ice picks, so that God can, as it were, the Holy Spirit can get in there and allow our heart to be open in a wounded kind of way. Um, and just to be see, to see, you know, just basic moments as holy. So I remember, you don't see this so much in Greece anymore, but back over 30 years ago, when I was becoming Orthodox, I went into the Cyclades and I would see small children who would pass the church and they'd just cross themselves. Um, or as you will see um, all the time in Greece, you know, somebody to drink a glass of water and they'll cross themselves or you know, they, that there is this some sense, a sanctification of, of every aspect of life. 
And it's something that we have to remind ourselves because we, and here's where Jan Aras was right. We, we live in a world which um, has it, as it were, has been forcefully uh, um, turned into a thing where, you, you know, there's this awful kind of secular realm. Uh, and and uh, then there's this sort of sacred thing, which is a private thing. Um, um, in some ways, sometimes we're we're forced to do that increasingly in the this so-called secular and neutral space. But in, in a way, we need to be um, have a certain you know the last true rebellion, a certain rebellion against this uh, artificiality. Now. Some people in uh, America, some of my friends are doing this. Uh, who are clergy, they they wear their cassocks everywhere. That's not my style. Um, I would rather do it by just, um, in, a, in fact, just interacting with people on, on a, in, a, in an average way and just encountering them as a gift. So there are different ways that we can do this. Um, one way, I think, is, and I do see that there is a popularity of this, particularly to the people because I was talking to somebody last night, people are just showing up in my, my church now, English people, and asking about orthodoxy all the time. And I can tell you this was not happening before the pandemic. So something like what happened in North America around the turn of the millennium is happening. And there's a tendency to want to go in one direction, which is to, uh, you know, the kind of wearing a cassock everywhere, kind of holy Russia, holy Greece, in a way to 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 break down this this awful division of the world into the secular and the sacred and uh but perhaps there's another way of doing this without as it were creating a type of sectarian church and maybe what we can do here today and in uh, tomorrow is to to work towards another vision a type of vision that, as it were, can bring the liturgy after the liturgy by sanctifying all manner of activities without creating, as it were, a sectarian church, a church which is uh, a sort of a counterculture, as one of my friends, the dear Father Lawrence Farley, uh, talks about. Because I'm not sure that that would work, particularly in, in, in the UK. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. Thanks. Oh, uh, thanks so much, Father Brandon, for your, um, you know, very uh, inspiring talk and thought provoking. Uh, I was also thinking about your title and how um, this idea of specifically resurrecting somehow the world, it made me think, well, is it dead? Does it need to be brought alive by us? Um, and it made me think, uh, you know, that of course it's it's the cross that leads to resurrection right and so these questions and like cherry asked about a certain you know these extremes that could happen where uh perhaps you know the cross aspect that leads to the resurrection and new life also of the cross of worship the cross of work mm. worship being a lot of work as those people who work at it would know, or any church service that you might be responsible for, you know, say chanting, um, maybe, maybe, you know, the balance, we find the balance through that experience of the, what is, you know, what is the productive kind of suffering that work is. So, you know, like if at the end of Genesis 3, uh, Adam and Eve receive a certain kind of because they've chosen suffering they've chosen death right but they're not handling it well and so god's like here you go here's some clothing and you're going to both have productive forms of suffering in different ways like can we look at it maybe like um the ascetical side of both worship of working on you know, choosing faith over fear on a daily basis, all of these things that we do have to work on if in the middle of John 6, the people ask, what can we, what shall we do to do the works of God? And Jesus says, perplexingly, this is the work of God that you believe in the one as if faith is work, right? So work, suffering, that aspect, 
that we don't terrorize people with rejoice, you know, <laughs> when on any feast you hear in a sermon, rejoice because it's Christmas, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, no, well, it's okay that you're not fixed and that you're not floating around like an annoying, uh, you know, Julie Andrews, uh, you know, but you're balanced, you know, like you're balanced. We know that you suffer, you know, we suffer as clergy, as monastics, as but this is always leading us to these spurts of joy that you mentioned at some point that, you know, spiritual awakening and joy take a lot of work and study, you know, that's normal, that's good, and it's productive. Yes. I mean, uh, beautifully, thank you, Raza, uh, you beautifully expressed. Um, uh, yes, I mean, it, it is very, one has to remind me, you know, when I'm I'm dealing with, Kids, for example, who refuse to go to bed or to do their homework, or um, as I have to do so often with administration and and uh, university politics, that to remember that this um, type of suffering, this type of frustration, or you know dealing with, and this is actually what causes me more heartache, is divisions in the church, and I've I've um, experienced in my time here as an Orthodox, two church splits um, in the last 20 years. That, um, uh, and this is why this um, Athenite, who I quoted, who talks about the tipoi, seeing that even within the divisions, that as it were, you, you have a seed of the resurrection. To remember that uh, God is there, and then in our suffering, and particularly the suffering of the church, when the church tears itself apart. And this is something I'm very aware of uh, because um, most of the godparents, uh, my godparents, uh, my kids are in the other church. <laughs> Just joking. But, uh, uh, and um, in a way, in my own life, I embody that because I take care of church, you know, from those different traditions, that God is there. And, and this suffering is productive that the spirit is involved and the spirit is moving towards a resurrection. Um, I would say here, Maranatha, you know, because when I look at the Orthodox world, um, it very often uh, I feel hurt would be the main uh, emotion that I have. Um, so, yes. Did you have a question? Okay, fine. Okay, uh, <clears throat> it's time to, do sorry. Oh, okay, maybe last question and then we have to cover it. I yeah. can ask it after as no, no, well. Fine. Yes, fine. It took me a while to compose it. I'm wondering, this is in reference to returning the world to a Sophianic character. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how can we reconcile the idea of returning the world to the Sophianic character perfection with evolution and the notion of transforming this creation into a more per a, a new perfected creation? I'm not denying that the world is broken because cl clearly um, things don't seem as they should be. But I am challenging, you know, as a biologist that mm. the world was one perfect um, because I have a hard time grasping that God couldn't get it right the first time around through God's, you know, hand of evolution and and evolution of thought and so on. How can we reconcile this return to Sophianic character? Yeah. I mean, what I'm talking about is a spiritual vision and reality. I'm I'm not one of the Orthodox, like Sarah from Rose, who would um, deny evolution. What we're we're looking for is, um, in a way, when we talk about the Genesis narrative, is a vision of what God intended. So, in 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 some sense, what we're talking about is uh, a, a reality of. Uh, eschatological reality so um maximus says that as soon as the human being was created he fell so this is something i think we need to contemplate um i think too often um we orthodox um think too much in terms of uh, when we're reading scripture and even the feasts like um for example the the entrance of the mother of god into the temple and, you know, they, they want to look for, um, I don't know, like a, we're dealing with a New York Times article or something. 
Um, so what I think we're talking about is, is we can certainly, you know, as a biologist, my wife's trained as a biologist and was a science teacher. And she always tells me, you know, that uh, Genesis is the vision. And what we're, we're talking about is um, in science is, is how it's done, but we can still believe that somehow God is behind that process. Um, now, uh, those who are scientists and theologians, I work with one of them, uh, my colleague Chris Southgate. Um, you know, he he wants to 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 go in the way of a sort of John Hick uh, and see that in fact uh, part of the beauty of creation, part of the suffering, is actually connected up with its glory, with 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 the brokenness is actually connected up with the resurrection, the cross in a way is connected up with uh, the resurrection. So uh, you could actually use some of our orthodox understandings and apply it to uh, the ideas uh, that, that in fact with evolution, you see some of these spiritual truths. So I'm talking about spiritual truths. That having been said, there are some people like my friend Paul Adusseur, who um, uh, certainly who will come out and say, absolutely, there was no historical Adam and Eve. Uh, and um, Bulgakov, uh, who I think is a helpful person, um, even though some people think he's a heretic, um, uh, he um, wanted to think about uh, the fall as a metaphysical event, as something which existed um, both in time but out of time. So he, he wants to, in, in a way, have his cake and eat it too. Um, but he certainly didn't believe that there was some Adam Joe Blow type so, um, and I don't know why people have such difficulty with, um, you know, trying to understand this uh, reality uh, of these being spiritual truths and why this is a nasty thing, you know, if, if we can't tie it to a particular time or event. So, you know, if you, if you say, um, well, actually, you know, the mother of God uh, uh, never went into the temple and, you know, and, uh, you know, was fed, you know, kind of from the shoe bread and all this kind of stuff. And people will think that you're a heretic. Um, but maybe what we need to do is um, um, to return to some of the truths which we see in people, uh, the, these kind of symbolic truths. One of my friends, Jonathan Pajot, uh, who has this show, The Symbolic World, I, I was there and when Jonathan was becoming Orthodox at the beginning, we, we had a lot of long conversations and he draws a lot from Jung and, and other thinkers. And uh, to understand that you don't need to play fact against symbol. Um, I guess that would be my response to you. Thank you. Facts are luminous. Okay. Thank you very much. I think okay. it's time to draw this um, discussion to a close. Um, Father Brandon, thank you very much.